It is tempting to think that more leadership or some kind of improved leadership will help us and our organizations work better. But what if leadership was part of the problem instead of the solution? What if our understanding of it only maintained principles of the past, which no longer serve us well? That's what I explore in my book, Dare to Unlead, and today in this podcast. Join me and my guest, a person quoted in the book or in tune with its values, to learn from them what it takes to unlead and succeed together. Welcome to the second episode of the Dare to Unlead podcast. Over the course of 11 episodes with a guest, we explore chapter by chapter the major themes discussed in the book. I hope you've enjoyed episode one with living organization thinker Myron Rogers as much as I have. This episode introduced us to change in the living systems that organizations are, what works, what doesn't work, what to watch out for, etc. Today, we're going to get into the meat of leadership, echoing chapter two of the book, which is titled The Persistent Failure and Fallacy of Leadership. What? <laughs> Persistent failure? <laughs> fallacy? Well, yes, definitely. We don't beat around the bush here. It's time to see through the harmful myth of leadership that we've been fed through courses, books, public speeches, uh, and supposedly um, inspiring individuals. And I imagine that my guest of the day, Stove Boyd, thinks uh, alike. We'll ask him. Right? Stove Boyd is a sharp and engaged observer of the world of work. He has already a rich career behind him that started in software systems and engineering and that blossomed into strategic planning and writing for professional media, research and analysis, especially in areas related to digital, social business and the future of work. Today, Stove is managing director founder, chief scientist of Work Futures, and forward industry fellow at RMIT University, the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. I met Stove, I think, 10 years ago or so at a conference in Paris, and I've always kept in touch. I admire his intellectual curiosity and the extent of the knowledge he shares with us. Uh, I admire his unabashed opinions, <laughs> his no-nonsense and humorous nature, which is so refreshing in a field overflowing with egos. Stowe, thank you so much for being here and welcome. It's, it's great to be with you again. <laughs> thank you. I've been looking so, forward to it. Oh, that's awesome. And me too. And Stowe, let's start with the first question. What is your art? What do you do? What does a work anthropologist do, and what do you do? It, uh, how do you do it in a, in your way? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what I do as an art, but hmm. um, I would say, I would say I'm dedicated to the principles and practices of sense making. You know, I feel that my job is much like being a teacher that I'm trying to explain things or connect things together that maybe other people haven't connected or, um, you know, as an, you know, as an iconoclast, the notion of debunking conventional wisdom, for example, is one of those higher aspirations for me. So that's basically it. And, then, and if there is an art aspect of it, it's that I spend a lot of time writing, mm. you know, in order to do that. Uh, the nature of the, you know, the pandemic led to sort of the, cessation of a lot of conferences so in the past i've done a lot of public speaking but that's really changed um in just the last few years so and i think uh that's fine i i, I enjoy writing and you know it's it's an equally interesting way to to you know make sense of things um it's just a little less social i think yeah and what led you to to doing that uh, I guess I've, I've always, I've always been intrigued with, uh, you know, writing. I got, I, I very early on, I, I, I was a head of a software company and I sold it off to my publicly traded competitor 
And a couple of years later, that company was acquired um, and I was set free with a big pile of money. <laughs> and so I took on the job of, yeah, well, I mean, enough to take a couple of years off uh, and pay for my college, my kids' college education. Um, and I took on a job right away of writing a newsletter for, you know, a, a, a company called Cutter Consortium. And um, I never really stopped. I mean, in 1999, I started blogging. I, you know, I was, you know, president of a media, little media company called Courant, where I met, you know, wonderful people. We had like 70 bloggers working for us. And so I never really stopped. I, and, and so now I, it's just a matter of course for me as I get up in the morning, I read things and write things. So um, that's how I got started. Mm, that's awesome. And what are the underlying principles of your work? How would you describe those, if any? Um, well, I think like a lot of other people, I have, you know, a certain number of, of issues, questions that like burn brightly in my mind. And so I'm constantly on the lookout for more information, better understanding of those questions. So, um, you know, I have a, you know, I'm a, I have a strong belief in the power of curiosity and uh, it's central importance mm. to being a thinking, you know, uh, thinking being in the world we live in. Uh, I wrote a piece a couple of years ago called 10 uh, Skills, 10 work skills for the post-normal world um, that was motivated by something I read from the, you know, uh, the Davos crowd, the WEF. And um, I think those things stand the test of time. You know, the, 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 those kinds of skills that I wrote about, and I, I invite people to go look at the whole list, but one of them is curiosity. And I think it's the central and most important uh behavior, if you will, that, um, that it creates a, a powerful loop that mm -hmm. both provides stability to people and also drives learning. So uh, I think that's the most central one. I could go into detail, but, you know, I think that's, that trumps everything else. That and sort of creative uncertainty, you know, <laughs> being uncertain about things, that notion of having strong opinions that are loose, weakly held. Uh, I think is another equally very important uh, principle to you know that's necessary. I love that. Uh, you're a, um, a recognized thought leader in so you're a recognized thought leader in the field of the future of work, which is sort of you can put anything behind that. <laughs> the future of work. Sure. Are, are there any uh, specific issues or questions or patterns you're paying attention to? in this gigantic field that the future work is? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated with the rise of uh, or apparently resurgence of interest in unionization. I think that's actually central to some of the things we might want to talk about today with the nature of the, this failure of leadership that we're going to talk about. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's an interesting one. I think I've always been in, interested in, uh, you know, uh, human cognition and how that complicates and animates what goes on in the in the world of work in in the business world um so i'm constantly you know sifting through things trying to find out more about that so and and you know i think it's matter like i said once upon a time a long time ago in, in a in a con in a connected world the most important thing is who you choose to follow and in this sense i'm meaning follow their work right so You, you, you quote a bunch of people in this chapter that I follow everything they write if I can. So um, that's, I think, a very important thing. Um, so the, the, these are shared ideas that a lot of us are writing about and thinking about. And so it's, it's, it's critically important to uh, have that 12 questions or whatever in your mind written down and then you know, be in pursuit of more and more information about them and try to make sense of it. So that's, I think, I think that's what I'm doing as a, a thought leader. Um, uh, and one of the things I've write, written about a lot is, you know, the, the failures of leadership, the, 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 the fact that we ascribe so much to these figures uh, in, in a way that goes back to the Bronze Age. I mean, it's incredibly primitive stuff that we 
just take as a given. Um, and in, in fact, I think that's very, you know, that's been problematic. I think it's intrinsically problematic. It's not that people aren't doing that job well, which may be true, but the notion that we should have a system that's based on, you know, the, the charismatic leadership of kings, for example, I mean, uh, I think that's dangerous, and uh, mm. and and we're we're better off as we figure out how to get away from it as quickly mm. as we can. Do you think it's human nature? Do you think we need that somehow, or what's behind that? No, 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 no. But I think it's deeply enmeshed in in the the the, the system of capitalism that animates the world that we live in, and uh, you know that's problematic. I mean, management leadership in business is given their power by the shareholders, the owners to do the, the, the will, if you will, <coughs> of the, of the managers and owners, I mean, of the owners and uh, everything else is secondary. And that's the way it's, you know, for years people interpreted, you know, the no nature of business is that's the way it's supposed to be. Everybody else is secondary. All the people that work in the businesses are just, you know, tools to be applied, hands on, you know, pulling the wrenches in the in the in the factory. And um, uh, I think I think we're trapped in that. And so the sooner we get out of it, the better. Mm. I think it's a Just problem. The, there's nothing I would say intrinsically bad about um, choosing a person to. I don't know, be the forefront to lead for others. Um, but it seems that we're, it seems we're following, we tend to be following the worst leaders in all sorts of fields, uh, politics, <laughs> business, medicine, uh, etc. Do you think we're addicted to bad leaders or do you think power changes people, changes leaders? Or is there anything specific to the times we're in or not really? What do you think? Um, there's a lot of interesting research uh, that says, for example, um, businesses naturally tend to select for senior leadership roles people that have certain characteristics, behavioral characteristics or psychological characteristics. And so some people have actually measured it and, you know, maybe as much as five or six percent in typical businesses, uh, the leadership are pathologically Uh, evil, you know they're they're psychopaths. Um, there's even a, a a thread of this discussion that suggests that the high the high death rate of senior executives is due to them being murdered by other executives. Murdered. I'm not even kidding, but it's a very high number. So if if in fact businesses are naturally selecting for kinds of people. And five percent of them are psychopaths. Then you know we're we're involved in a system that, first of all, is like musical chairs. You know, it's designed so that there will be people at the top of a pyramid, and they go through some selection process. And at the end, there's one chair left, and you know, one guy sitting on it. Usually, it's a guy too. So, um, you know, that's maybe that's not the best way to select people to, for example, create an environment in which human well-being and uh, the, the passion uh, of belongingness and the desire for purpose in our lives, that the person selected to create that environment is a, likely a psychopath or 5% chance, and that the other people that are also in the running also have terrible characteristics, you know, because of the way the system works. Um, maybe that's not the best setup. Right. <laughs> But that's one we have, you know. There yeah, are enlightened there are enlightened beings who somehow find their find their way into positions of authority in big companies. But there's also a lot of people that are just not nice people and they're they're even at the best they they don't put first the interests mm. of the people that are in the business that work for them. Mm. The the chapter opens with a sentence, a, a quote I, I really find admir admirable from John, John Steinbeck, who wrote, It has always stra seems strange to me 
the things we admire in men, kindness and generosity, openness, honesty, understanding and feeling, are the concomitants of failure in our system. And those traits we, we detest, sharpness, greed, acquisitiveness, meanness, egotism and self-interest are the traits of success. And while men admire the quality of the first, they love the produce of the second. Huh? I, I, he says it better than me, but I, I was basically <laughs> saying the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, ama it's amazing. Uh, you're, by the way, in this chapter, you're quoted too. Uh, you're quoted saying, when passing through the door of our workplaces, we step back into a constitutional monarchy, much like those of the 1700s. It's a sentence from an article of yours titled, Today's business organization is an oligarchy, and that needs to change. Can you explain? Uh, can you say anything about it? Right. So, I mean, the, 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 the monarchy, constitutional monarchy, is the notion that there are royals in the world that are royal because of who their grandparents were and so on. And it gets passed down, right? Um, and so it's a sense of that there's an elite that are dubbed the leaders. Um, for example, think about the military, which has gotten relaxed uh, in recent era, in the recent era, but there's still a fundamental divide. There's officers and non-officers, right? And officers are gentlemen, the officers and gentlemen notion, or now gentle women, I suppose. Um, and these are typically people that are college, the, the classic thing, the college educated st studied management theory or economics or law or whatever. And the other people are somebody who went to high school, maybe, or maybe a, a lesser college, and they apply and get a job, but they're not grouped with the owners and the managers that the owners put in control. Uh, of the business. So there's this notion of an elite um, the merit and there's a myth of meritocracy that says, you know, these people rise to the top because of their characteristics or their education or, you know, that they are, you know, the son of the founder. And so they're naturally, you know, sitting in the boardroom or whatever. Um, but I think this is, you know, like I said before I lose to this, a Bronze Age kind of notion or whatever. And it's better said, you know, it's been better said by people like Elizabeth Anderson, who talks about it in her book on, uh, uh, you know, private government, right? Uh, the notion is that we give control to these people who run the enterprise as, you know, with some notion of governance, but it's a private government and it's, uh, you know, subject to only its own rules. I mean, there are conventions that are sort of carry across, but um, how businesses decide to do what they do and how they evaluate people and how they try to motivate people. So it's really left up to them. There's very, you know, there's degrees of governance that governments uh, try to reach into businesses and control them. For example, witness this breakthrough where the, it seems like now we're going to make non-complete complete clauses uh, illegal in the United States. Great. If if it can get through the Supreme Court, we'll see. But that's an example of a thing that businesses decided to do and just did. Um, mm -hmm. In some places, it was made illegal by uh, state governments. But otherwise, it was widely practiced. Um, and who says? Why is that fair? Well, they just, it's good for them. So they did it. <laughs> you know, there's this funny quote, Any, anything that 500 businessmen agree to do becomes legal. Uh, in America. So I think the, the notion you pass through the door and you're sub, uh, now a subject to a constitutional monarchy, or in, in, in Anderson's terms, you're now a subject to a private government, um, I think is a compelling way to think about it. And so, in fact, I believe that we should take that paradigm forward and, for example, you know, switch to a completely, uh, you know, transactional relationship between the, the employees, the managees, I call them, you know, the, the employees that aren't managers, managees, um, they should form unions, 
and allow the union to do all the negotiation and have a purely transactional relationship with the business and not get involved in what some people call enmeshment. You know, got the company's attempt to enmesh us to through notions like, you know, employee engagement and team building exercises and all sorts of other things so that we can get all woo woo about the you know common purpose and how wonderful you know it is to be working in a great company that really loves its people blah 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 and then there's a downturn in the economy and they cut 30 percent of the people without a single thought about because they don't really care it's just the technique to get people to push faster and harder and you know, get productivity high and so on. Well, you know, that's not what I'm about. I, I want to live my life and have a family and I would like to have job security and I would like steady paycheck, but I'm not going to get all woo-woo anymore. And I think that's what a lot of the, you know, this recent uh, surge of, of disengagement, uh, you know, and all the people that are quitting their jobs, the great resignation or whatever you want to call it. There's a million names for it. Now. Mm-hmm. It's just people saying, it's, I don't buy it anymore. I don't, you know, you know, don't try to wiggle your fingers in my eyes and put foo-foo dust on everything. You know, I just want to have a life and I want stability and purpose. Yes, it's my own purpose. It's not, you know, something that you hired a consulting firm to come in and put up on the posters on the walls in the cafeteria. Hmm. So I think, I think there's, I think we should go all the way. Right. And just, you know, just say it's employment. I've got a job. I do my work. You pay me. And, uh, you know, don't expect me to, uh, you know, turn on a dime. This is this whole thing about people's being disengaged because they don't like change. They, you know, change for what? What purpose is this change serving? Yeah, they're trying to get us to go faster and produce more light bulbs per hour, but uh, I don't, I don't care. You know, I shouldn't put that as the highest priority in my life. So I think that's what it is. It's a growing disenchantment uh, mm. with, you know, the the neoliberal concept of a, a corporation and everyone should be working at common purpose to reach these higher goals. And, and if we do that, we'll change the world. And, you know, most companies aren't Patagonia, you know, they're, mm-hmm. they're just trying to make light bulbs and, you know, you know, mm-hmm. pay back huge amounts of money to the investors. You know, the, the, the disenchantment that I'm talking about is significant these days but you look at what's gone on in the last three decades you know all of this money has been pulled away even though company people have become incredibly productive all that value is given to the owners and the managers and the average person is making you know l- roughly the same amount of dollars as they were making 25 years ago and and, and that means that they're poorer even though they're more productive it's just completely unfair so I think we should just, you know, take the blinders off our eyes and say, you know, these leaders who are supposedly leading us into a brave new future are just exploiting the hell out of us or exploiting the hell out of people that work in businesses. I don't, you know, I'm a, I'm a solo, so mm-hmm. I don't actually have a boss or any of that. Mm-hmm. But and, and they're exploiting I, themselves too, as well. They're, they're managing themselves as assets that need to be managed right. it's uh yeah and they have high incredibly high. incredibly long work weeks and they kill themselves and they're stressed out and yeah they're they're victims of it as well but of course they're getting really well paid for it. yeah <laughs> <laughs> what does a good leader look like in your opinion how do they behave well in the new the new model that i have in my mind which is an outgrowth actually it was lee lee bryant and i were writing a bunch of things about this more or less at the same time a couple of years ago um and the notion is that we there's a new emerging model of sort of enlightened progressive uh thinking about leadership and the fundamental notion is that you have certain people who's who are managing a product line or something in the business and their job is to you know get resources and knock down the barriers so that the people who are actually 
you know, building that kind of refrigerator or whatever, uh, can get their job done and, you know, are tightly aligned with the needs of customers and so on. <clears throat> but they're, in a sense, facilitators, right? And then at a, a, a at the highest level, there's a the top level, if you will, or the I think of it as circle. So at the the outer circle, you can envision the job of uh, people who are trying to create an environment in which uh, product things can or services can happen. And so their role is sort of creating an environment in which it's possible for these kinds of things to happen and <clears throat> sending a course saying, yeah, we're going to be the best appliance company in the world, right? You know, I'm thinking of hire as an example, because at the time I was writing this stuff, I was working with them on writing about these kinds of concepts. And then there's a, a sort of intermediate level of, of, of leadership where people are trying to grapple with things across Let's, I'm thinking about it in products because it's a good example. Like all the refrigerator lines that we have inside of the business have to have certain standards and 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 conven conventions that make everything workable. <clears throat> and so they would be in the role of sort of arbitrary uh, arbitrating over all the refrigerator brands inside of a company, as opposed to somebody else who would be taking care of all the air conditioning brands, that sort of thing, and getting people to work together or compete against each other. <clears throat> so there's this multiple tier model, but the leaders are people that are not telling you what to do. They're creating a context at greater or lesser uh, size they're creating a context in which people actually can do their, their thing, whatever it is, you know, make, bring to the market this new kind of refrigerator that has, you know, the pumps the air out of the vegetable compartment so that the vegetables are fresher for a longer period of time. They actually have that refrigerator, so I'm not making it up. <laughs> so that, that model, I think, is sort of a, a brilliant way to, to imagine a future business um, where forget the notion yet of how people get paid and how much money is being pulled out and given to the shareholders. <laughs> Hopefully that could be f fixed too. But this is a model of where, uh, you know, there's a great deal of autonomy at every, at every scale in the business because people are trying to make their refrigerator uh, popular and if it isn't popular, then the people disband that group and go join some other more successful group and so on. So it's a, it's kind of a, the notion of it's it operates like a city, not an army, if you will. Mm -hmm. That you know people are coming and going, and you know somebody decides to put a deli on that corner. Well, you don't have to get permission of the mayor to open a deli. You just have to meet the rules of zoning and the health department and so on. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more entrepreneurialism fundamentally in such a model, and less directed controlled, mandated kind of growth. So I think that's a fascinating model. Um, it's just not very widely applied. The people that do things like that are pretty successful, but strangely enough, it turns out it's very, very difficult to adopt this model. It took hire as one of the best examples. It took them decades going through many troubled uh, you know, transitions to get to the end state. And they're very successful now. You know, their mm. uh, their model works very well. Um, it's just very hard to get there. And it, mm. partly that is, I think, it's because most people don't operate their business that way. They operate it the modern day, you know, uh, pyramid notion that we talked about earlier. And and so most people floating around in the world are indoctrinated into that kind of concept of what a business is and how it's managed. And they, it's very hard for them to move into a, a this, as I call it, the, the, the three circles model of, you know, emergent uh, organizations um, because they don't know how it all works. Mm. That's, and, really that's really interesting. You know, it's problematic. Yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. And I have... Uh... I actually have reservations about not really the higher model itself, although I find it uh, extremely to be extremely competitive, and I wonder what yeah. its consequences on quality and uh, and on human health uh, 
are. I don't know about this, but Lee will be a, a guest in one of the further ep next episodes of Dare to Unlead podcast. So I'm really happy to speak a about brilliant, uh, brilliant structure. Guy. I actually think our focus on structure is a little bit overrated. And um, <laughs> there are many other things we can, we should pay attention to. Uh, in order to work better collectively. Now, if you were appointed as head of uh, an organization, a big one, maybe, uh, what would be your first move? What would you do? Uh, I'd go around and talk to people and listen to them. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I have, you know, these ideas, but I've also not been a manager, you know, for a very long time. You know, I mean, I have been a manager and I've run you know, big groups of people, well, relatively. At one time I had like 170 people working for me at one company, managing, you know, contracts of $27 million and so on. And back in the day, that was a lot of money. Um, but uh, I, I really don't know what I would do. I'm not sure I would take that job. Hmm. Um, I would rather be the advisor to the person who took, got that job. Hmm. You know, that would be a better role for me, I think. Um, but I, I think, I think there's a whole bunch of things that would have to be, it, and a lot of it has to be based on, you know, what is, how does the company run now? Yeah. Right. And what's its situation? Um, and you know, I would, I would do it based on a bunch of principles. I think it has to be principle based, you know, that you should try to push the greatest degree of autonomy as you can to individuals, groups, other assemblages of, of people, departments or whatever. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, try to root out evil, <laughs> you know, the things that are baked in that are just bad. Um, I would be the kind of person that would attempt to build employee councils as a part of the governance structure of the business. So it's a, we want you to be unionized, please, you know, each group, like, The designers can join the designers union and the people working in the plant, the people who are driving our trucks, whatever, please be unionized. Let's start with that. And then we'll build a workers council as part of our board of directors. Wow. That's the first, you know, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's the kind of thing you see in very commonly in, in say Germany or mm -hmm. the Netherlands or whatever, mm -hmm. where they, you know, is as part of, you know, the post world war II regeneration of of europe uh that was necessary and they didn't fight against it they they embraced it they went with it and um i, I think it's something we severely lack here in the u.s mm. yeah so that would be would, one of the things i would do that would be awesome i think it would need some revisiting here in europe as well because uh, over the over the years those things have often morphed into um an, an additional bureaucracy or a set of uh, you know fixed roles and um, maybe not as uh, co-constructive as it was intended to be but nevertheless it's a it's a great uh, great thing to a great asset to cultivate and, and nurture i agree with you well so for, so for example yeah. just a one, the one example one example that you know mm -hmm. that we're confronted with right now all these business large businesses that just laying people off mm -hmm. you know there is there's been a history of not doing that in these uh, large companies that have workers' councils. And what they do is they, they put a value on the fact that when the economy turns around again, we will have, we want to hold on to our trained people so they can gear up with the uh, return of the, uh, you know, of the economy. And so, for example, in America, our airlines, even though we gave them all kinds of money to not do this, they fired all their, you know, pilots and and uh, flight attendants. And so then when things came back, they, you know, we got into this horrible mess because they had couldn't hire them back fast enough, right? Mm -hmm. So we had all this air travel problems for the last year. And in most recently, these ridiculous, you know, the FAA going down and, you know, the, uh, the uh, Southwest Airlines catastrophe, you know, that was just ghastly because of, them consistently not investing in the technology they needed to because they were pulling all the money out and giving it to the shareholders, yeah, <laughs> right? So crazy. I think I think the notion that companies would do a different job about how they handle, you know, people 
if those people actually had a voice in what was going on, as opposed to being treated like sheep, you know, being with their fleeces all being snipped off and sent off to the, you know, the, to the butcher shop. So, I mean, I think that's, yes, in fact, mm. you know, you can't have a situation where mm. union unionizations, especially mm. in co- the context of businesses that oppose them, yeah. can be problematic. Yeah, that's awesome. So we're coming to the end of the of our chat today. What would you say to someone who hasn't read Dare to Unlead yet, apart from... Uh, read it <laughs> what would you say um i think i would recommend they read it the way i read it which was slowly i mean and in, in, in fact i i did a quick read when you sent me the galleys and that's so i could make some comments but then i put it aside and i read you know a, a couple of pages of a chapter and then i put the book down and i tried to think about the ideas over time In fact, I have this heavily annotated PDF. Uh, you know, I've, I've got it open on my screen right now. Here's the, all the things that I pulled up that was incredibly important to me. And, you know, uh, as I mentioned, you know, there's all the, you know, people that you quote that are brilliant. But, you know, going through a full chapter of this and trying to assimilate it all in, let's say, one reading, which you could do. You could actually read it that fast. But I don't think it's a good way to approach it. I think it's... Uh, You know, it's it's very rich, and so you have to let it work its well way on you over time. I must say that's the way I read your newsletters, <laughs> which is uh, <laughs> Work Futures is uh, yeah probably one of the only newsletters I read um, very regularly. Maybe not all issues at once uh, as soon as they are published, but uh, I save them and I get back to them because they're incredibly insightful. And always with this, um, uh, I mean, you curate, you, you, it's more than curation. You curate, but then you comment, you, you, you weave threads, you, you make sense. Yeah, you talked about sense making in the beginning of this show, which is exactly uh, why I love reading World Futures. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, please do it uh, for another lot, many, many years. Um, so yeah. where can people find you on Substack? That's right. That's the workfutures.io. Yeah, the, the, oh, okay. uh, I have my own domain, so that's that's an easy way. Awesome. Um, uh, I also write occasionally things that aren't about the future of work, and you can take a look at uh, stoboy.com for that. I also have occasionally certain topics I write on Medium. So when I'm writing about, you know, these tools for thought, for example, like I use Obsidian as my my uh, set of workings, if you will. Um, I write about that at Medium because there's a really big community there that's interested in it. But primarily, you know, workfutures.io, if people are interested in the future of work angle, that's that's the place to go. Awesome. So all links will be attached to the, the description of this episode. Thank you cool. so much, Stove. It was uh, really delightful to have you with us. And I wish you the very best and we keep in touch for the future of work, more insights and uh, more, um, uh, how can I say, uh, more constructive criticism of the world of work and of current leadership. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Great insights. Thank you all for listening. You'll find more info in Dare to Unlead, the book, and all links in the podcast episode description. And now, what else? Action! To explore further and apply these ideas to your own context, reach out to me at weneedsocial.com. Let's unlead together. <laughs>